Well, most important, live a life that is worthy of Christ's gospel. Most important, live a life that is worthy of Christ's gospel. So you heard Ruth mention at the beginning of the service, and Mark as well, the rest of this month we are preaching a sermon series from Paul's letter to the Philippians that we have called Raise the Bar. When a high jumper or a pole vaulter clears a bar on a jump, it's not over. Once you clear the bar, they then raise it, and you want to go higher and higher and higher. And our hope is that we will hear the call of Paul to the Philippians and to raise the expectations of our life as Christians. And the series certainly ties into our our stewardship emphasis because we also want to be about the work of raising the expectations of our life together as Ocala First United Methodist Church. This church has been faithful. This church has reached great heights, but once you have cleared a height, it's not over. You raise the bar and you go again. And so we hear Paul's word to the Philippians. Live together in a manner worthy of Christ's gospel. Now Paul is writing this letter to a church that he founded in Philippi, a church that was very near and dear to him. In some of Paul's letters, it's clear he's writing and and really intending a more general audience. He addresses it to a church, but he really expects that letter to circulate, and, and it's more general. But this letter is much more personal. It's clear he's writing to people who he feels a lot of affection for. Now, we didn't read the beginning of the letter, but you can just hear it as he addresses them. He says, I thank God every time I mention you in my prayers. Prayers full of joy. I am glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete it. My prayer is that your love might become even more rich with knowledge and insight so that you can decide what really matters and be filled with the fruit of all righteousness. He has walked with this church maybe for two years as it was being founded. He continues to reach out to them. He loves them, and he wants to encourage them. But even as he writes these words, Paul is himself in a tight spot. The beginning of the letter makes clear Paul is writing from prison. He does not know if he's going to be released. He doesn't know if he's going to be sentenced to death. Paul found himself in prison a lot because of his work as an apostle, as an evangelist. And our reading picks up right at that moment in the scripture, right as he's talking about being a prisoner, not knowing what's going to come to him when he says to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Dying is gain for Paul sitting in prison. He's being honest and transparent about his feelings. He's torn between the two, he says. If he dies, he gets to be with Christ. If he lives, he gets to keep making a difference. And again, he's honest. For him, his personal preference would be to go to be with Christ. But he recognizes that there's something more important than just what he desires. He knows that it's far better for him, far more important for him to live so that he can continue to serve. Now, he's being honest about his selfishness. For him to die is, for him, a choice for himself. But to live and seek to continue his work is a choice for something beyond him, beyond his personal preference, beyond what he would wish for himself. He sees it as necessary to do the work of Christ. He helps us understand that our lives must be about Christ and not just ourselves. So that's where Paul is writing from. The Philippians are not quite so bad off, but they have their own challenges. Philippi was one of the most loyal Roman cities. They took pride in their service to Caesar, and anybody who wasn't all in in that way was often persecuted. The environment was hostile to the church at Philippi. Because for the earliest Christians throughout the Roman Empire, they said, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. All the citizens of Rome said, Caesar is Lord. 
And those two things are incompatible. They were a small minority surrounded by people who did not only mistrust them because they kept saying that Jesus is Lord, but they even considered these early Christians as unpatriotic, as disloyal, even treasonous. And it helps you make sense as you heard the words of Paul. He says, live a life worthy of the gospel. But then he goes on, he says, stand firm. Be united in one spirit and be united in one mind as you struggle together to remain faithful. Your faithfulness, your courage are a sign. God has generously granted you the privilege of not only believing in Christ, but also suffering with him. Those are words of inspiration and words of encouragement for people for whom their faith is going to cost them something. And they are going to have to stand together to make it. And so for Paul, living a life worthy, raising the bar of expectations for his discipleship, meant that he had to look beyond his personal desires to what God desired for him, which was to live. And for the Philippians, raising the bar of expectations meant finding courage to live in a hostile environment so that their faithfulness would have been worthy of Christ's gospel. And so the question for us reading these words thousands of years later is what does it mean for us to live a life that is worthy of Christ's gospel. We don't find ourselves in prison like Paul. We don't find ourselves in a hostile environment where we're persecuted like the Philippians, but we're still called to live a worthy life. What does that mean for you and for me? Well, in the same way for Paul and Philippians, context matters. Where you find yourself in your life personally matters and how you answer that question. Do you find yourself in difficult circumstances? I am sure that there are many in this room who do. Maybe you can relate a little more to Paul and the church at Philippi than maybe you would say out loud. Prisons, after all, come in all kinds of disguises, things that have us trapped and locked down. And sometimes life does seem to conspire against us. If it's not one thing, it's another. Sometimes it's the consequences of choices that we make and we're paying the price. But sometimes it feels like life's just sort of falling on us where we can't catch a break. Paul helps us to see how in those moments you can continue to have hope and even find joy. Because the irony is, is that Paul knew that he wasn't in charge of whether he lived or died. He was in prison. They were going to make that choice for him. And of course, it occurred to me that at the end of the day, we're not really in charge of whether we live or die either. Each day is a gift. And the insight Paul gives us is that whether we are in life or in death, we belong to God. And because we have faith that we belong to God, we can therefore have hope and what is to come. There's a mission coordinator for a Disciples of Christ denomination who writes in a devotion on this text, like Paul, I choose life. I choose to look beyond my circumstances and believe that God will show me a way that will lead me out of my prisons, out of those valleys of shadows and death in which we all sometimes find ourselves. God will lead us out. There is no need to abandon hope. Rather, we may embrace it and live. That's God's invitation to us, that in the midst of whatever we are living through, we can choose life. We can choose hope. We can put our faith in the fact that God has already claimed us, and we have nothing to fear. I think that's a powerful world, word for anyone who is facing shadows, facing illness, who is grieving or struggling in any way. But what about a word for those for whom that doesn't describe? It doesn't describe everybody all the time. And for a lot of people, they would say, you know what, things are going pretty well right now. You don't find yourself in a valley. You don't find yourself in darkness. You're not facing difficult times. You would say, I have a lot of blessings in my life, and I'm grateful for all the ways that I can count these blessings. My marriage is good. 
my family is good, my children are being raised well, or my grandchildren, and I'm proud of, of who my children have become and who my grandchildren are becoming, and even great-grandchildren. Your work and your business is going well, and you're tasting success. Or you worked hard for so many years, and now you're at your leisure, and life is pretty good. You have good friends. When you find yourself in a place like that, what word does Paul have for us? Because I find myself there more often than not, too. I mean, the truth is, is that difficult times have a clarifying effect on how our life is built and on whether our life is really worthy. When things are going well, sometimes it's hard to really know. It's those difficult times that help clarify. I, I think of Jesus' parable, if you remember. He talked about the man who built his house upon a rock and another man who built his house upon the sand. And you know, while everything was going well, they both had wonderful, beautiful homes and were thankful to have a roof over their head. It wasn't until those rains came that they had clarity on what their life was really based on. That wisdom of their foundations was revealed for all to see. And the truth is, is that when life is good, we can grow complacent. When we do not face life and death choices on a daily basis, we can lose focus about what really matters. And when we don't live in a hostile environment where our faith might bring us persecution, it's not hard to grow maybe a little too comfortable. And being complacent and losing focus and growing too comfortable brings its own kind of trouble. Because God can shift from the center of our lives and into the sidelines when we're not even paying attention. It's not something that we intend. It's not something that, that we would ever, ever intend or want to happen in our lives. But because we haven't been paying attention, suddenly we've become more self-centered or more self-serving. And those things that we desire do become the center. And our preferences become our small God. We don't have the clarifying experience of Paul being in prison, of life or death. And so we let our guard down. And so perhaps Paul's call to the Philippians is even more important for us to hear. Live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because doing so takes courage, whatever your circumstances. The message of the gospel is very simple, that we belong to God. We were created in God's image, and God has claimed us as God's people. And in Christ and through Christ, God has healed us, and God has forgiven us. God has restored us. God has redeemed us. We belong to God. And what Paul is asking the Philippians, but I think Paul is asking us too, as he writes his letter to Ocala First United Methodist Church, is are you living your life in a manner that reveals who we belong to? Are our lives a sign that point to the source of all good gifts? Because life itself is grace. Life itself is a gift, and we are but caretakers of all that God has given us. Do we live a life worthy of those gifts? Our marriages are gifts from God. Are we caring for our spouse in a manner that's worthy of the gospel? Is our faithfulness and devotion, does it reflect God's faithfulness and devotion to us? Our families, our children, our gifts from God. Are we raising our children or our grandchildren in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you love and care for them in a way that helps them understand the way God loves and cares for them. Our jobs, our careers are a gift from God as the way you go about your work each day or the way that you use your time in retirement worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do we heed the simple rules that we talked about a few weeks ago from John Wesley to first do no harm and then to do all the good you can? The money that you earn, that you invest, that you live off of is a gift from God and we are caretakers of it. 
There's a way that we care for our money, the way that we spend our money, the generosity with which we share our money with the church and with those who are in need in the community. Does that reveal that we belong to God? Our friends are a gift from God. The talents and gifts God has given us, whether it's to be a teacher or a business leader or in law or in medicine or working with our hands or our compassion or our desire to serve, all of those are a gift from God. Are we using them in a way that's worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This church is a gift from God. And have we taken it for granted or do we desire it our life together to be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul gets it right from his prison cell. He is honest and transparent that, yeah, he has the selfish desire to escape this life and to be with Christ, but he recognizes that his life must point beyond himself to something greater. Living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to make Christ that thing that is beyond us and that is greater to which all that we are and all that we do points. To put it simply, Christ must be our foundation, must be the center of all. And then regardless of the circumstances, we can live a life that is worthy. John Wesley passed down a covenant prayer. It gets to the heart of this message. We'll share it in a little bit after the sermon. It's found in our hymnal. He says, I'm this prayer, praying to God, I'm no longer my own, but yours, God. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing or put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you. Let me be exalted for you or laid low by you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I yield all things to you, O Lord. That prayer, this this message from Paul the Philippians, it all says this, whatever comes into your life, whether it's good fortune and wealth or if it's hard times and poverty, whether it's good health or illness, whether it's good times or bad, we lay it all before God. We neither take good fortune for granted nor give in to despair when times are bad. We give it all to God. Because in good times, we have the opportunity to be generous and to be humble. And in so doing, we honor Christ. And in suffering and when facing death, which will come to all of us, we have the opportunity to be courageous in our hope. And in so, honor Christ. And so whatever the circumstances, whatever we face, the good news is that you and I belong to God. We lay it all before God. We allow God to be the center from which we live our lives. And so that in life or in death, we belong to God. And raising the expectations of our lives is raising ourselves out of that self-interest and lifting us, lifting us up to be a people of God, a light And when other people see our lives, they can see their way to the source of our life. That is our call. That is the good news. That's what it means for us to live a worthy life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.